It's a joy to worship with you. And before we get into the sermon, just wanted to remind you last week, if you were here, that Rob and Mark got up and they uh, were encouraging us to go deeper in our life of evangelism. And so uh, Rob has a class after the service today. If you want to connect with him, I've seen some of the stuff that he's going to be teaching about, and it's really great. So I hope that you will connect with him after the service, and then you guys going to meet. Where are you going to meet, Rob? In the Family Life Center. So just go right off through the patio, grab a cup of coffee, and then you can go into the Family Life Center and connect with him, and uh, you'll get started. It'll be great. Okay, so I want to remind you of that. And uh, as you can see, the last couple weeks here, we've been talking about this concept of sacrificial giving. And this morning, I want to give you the principle, okay, in case you tune out 20 minutes in, (laughs) that you will have the principle that is going to guide the sermon this morning, okay? And... Uh, The principle is this concept that it is the cross that makes the crown. It is the cross that makes the crown. And I want you to think about Jesus' life and the things that he was tempted with many times in his journey on this earth was to skip his discipleship steps to skip the difficult parts of his journey, right? You know, when he is there with the devil and he's being tempted, you know, it's a temptation of, Jesus, use your power so that you don't have to experience the pain of being human. And there's times where Jesus will do something great and They'll want to crown him. They'll want to make him king. But he knows that he has a discipleship journey that he's supposed to go on. And so he willfully chooses to deny the crown and and that offering before the cross. He chooses the cross because he knows that ultimately it's the cross that makes the crown. Okay, so that's our guiding principle for today. We're going to jump down into the Old Testament, and either you have a Bible or there's one in your pew, and I'm going to ask you to turn to Numbers. It's in the beginning of the Bible. The first five books of the Bible are, are known as the Torah, and you know that's Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And for a Jew, this is something that I loved learning, you know, it's it's learning deeper and deeper. For a good Jew, the Torah became known as the way, the truth, and the life, right? So you know that phrase because Jesus uttered that phrase. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But what he was saying is that I am, as it says in John, I am the word, In the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus is the lived expression of the Torah. And, you know, when I was telling my family about how I'm going to be preaching from Numbers chapter 6 on a Nazarite vow, they said to me, make sure you explain to people what Numbers is. And make sure you explain to people, you know, where it comes from and what's meaningful about it. Because sometimes we're not familiar with these Old Testament scriptures and the principles that are drawn and they're echoed over and over again throughout scripture. That, you know, the New Testament disciples of Jesus and writers of the Bible would have had as a a guiding force of how they articulated life in their time. Okay? So with that, we're going to have some fun. I hope that's okay with you. Uh, maybe you already know it, and then you're, you're extra great. But we're going to go to uh, Numbers chapter 6. And there's going to be a really familiar verse, but it's going to come after a few verses that are pretty fun, but they're different, okay? So 
chapter 6, it says the Nazarite in my Bible. And we're going we're gonna to just cover the main ideas within this, so we'll jump around a little, so you just stick with me, okay? So, chapter 6, starting in verse 1, says this. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, if a man or a woman wants to make a special vow, a vow of dedication to the Lord as a Nazarite, they must abstain from wine and other fermented drink and must not drink vinegar made from wine or other fermented drink. So the first thing I want you to notice in the scripture is that it's, it's saying here in, a, in my NIV Bible, it says, a special vow. And I think on the, the slide, we have this word in Hebrew is just a, three letters, P-L-Y. And this word is used a few different times in scripture. And the concept is that if you want to see wondrous things, if you want to see miraculous things, if you want to see God in his fullness, then you can take a special vow. And so this is like throwing down the gauntlet, right? This is going the other way of our culture. Our culture is saying, do the easy things, stay comfortable, and this Nazarite vow saying, you want to know God? You want to know the special wonder of God? If that is your heart's desire, then there is a way. There is a way to get there. And this may not be the way for everybody, right? This is a special designation. But the principle of this special designation is incredibly valuable. Okay, the principle that guides this. So this special designation, the first thing that the Nazarite was commissioned to do if they wanted to take the Nazarite vow was that they would abstain from wine, like we just read, right? And wine was such a huge part of their culture, right? On the Passover, when uh, they would have a Passover feast, there are four promises that God gave to Israel, that he would redeem them, that he would rescue them, that he would deliver them, and that they would become his own. And at, at, at a Passover Seder, there would be four cups, and those four cups would be filled with wine, and they would celebrate each one of those promises that God gave them, right? And water in this time was, you know, at, more scarce than it is now, and so a lot of what was drunk was wine, and so they were drinking wine in their households, they were drinking wine in special celebrations, they were drinking wine in church, so abstaining from wine would have been a very difficult task for a good Jew who had that so patterned in their life. So this is a special discipline to take the Nazarite vow, okay? So that's a first principle. This idea of abstaining from wine, okay? Jump down with me to verse 5. It says, During an entire period of the Nazarite vow, no razor may be used on their head. They must be holy until the period of their dedication to the Lord is over. They must let their hair grow long. So every hippie in the house is like, amen, right? <laughs> But this was an outward expression that there was a commitment being made by a young man or a young woman who wanted to make this special vow. And so you could see somebody's hair grow long and say they are deciding to make this incredible vow with God. Okay? And then part of this too is that if you mess up, you got to start over again. So if you, at one point in your journey, get exposed to these things and you, you're not allowed, you don't complete it, then it goes all the way back again. Major bummer, right? So you might shave your head, then grow it again. So you would know 
where on the journey you were in the Nazarite vow, okay? Then it says, turn with me, okay, so throughout the period, their dedication to the Lord, this must not go, they must also not go near a dead body. Okay, so we got wine, we got long hair, and we have no near a dead body. Well, for us, because we have hospitals, this is like, okay, no prob, right? Like, we can avoid that because we have a place where people will go, but in this culture, I mean, you think about how ancient these ideas are, right, that are going to live for us again today. And you think about that culturally, for them, you, they, in their house, there would have been somebody they would have been familiar with who probably died, right? Because there's no hospital to send them to. It probably would have been somebody born in their house too, right? Because both birth and death were an ever-present reality within the household. And so if somebody died within their household, that would have been the family's duty to do the embalming and take care of the people. And so death would have been something that would have been much more in the face of people in this culture. And they would have had a hard time avoiding it. Okay, so there's another part here that's like throwing down the gauntlet. Okay, so we got wine, we have long hair, we have avoiding you know, people who are dead to become unclean if you do. Okay, and then I'm going to, let's jump all the way to 13. Now, this is the law of the Nazarene. When the period of their dedication is over, they are to be brought to the entrance of the tent of meeting. There they are to present their offering to the Lord, a year-old male lamb without defect for a burnt offering, a year old ewe lamb without defect for a sin offering, a ram without defect for a fellowship, a fellowship offering, together with their grain offerings and drink offerings and a basket of bread made with the finest flour and without yeast, thick loaves with olive oil mixed in and thin, thin loaves brushed with olive oil. And I'm going to just translate that as nobody could afford this. Okay. So what this is saying is, give us everything. Give up everything. All your finances. You want to take the Nazarite vow? You're going to spend a lot of time getting your finances in order, getting these sacrifices in order so you can bring them to the temple. In fact, in Acts, just so you don't think this is just an Old Testament thing, in Acts chapter 20, Paul comes across a few of a group that is going through the Nazarite vow, and they're stuck at this level because this is the hardest level to accomplish. And so he commissions the church in his community to say, you know what we're going to do together? We're going to help these young men complete their Nazarite vow. And we're going to do that. We're going to take up a special offering so that these young men can complete this amazing feat. You know what I mean? It's like the Spartan run, whatever, like, you know, Navy SEAL test type thing. And it's like the community is going to come at the end of that, and it's going to help bring them to this special moment. Okay, and then one last thing. Let's keep going here. Verse 18. Then, at the entrance of the tent of meeting, the Nazarite must shave off the hair that symbolizes their dedication, and they are to take the hair and put it into the fire that is under the sacrifice, the fellowship of the offerings. Okay, so one time I was at church, right, and it was a, a Christmas uh, candlelight service, and my uh, sister was holding her candle too close to the row in front of her, and the person's hair started to catch on fire, right? That's not a pleasant smell <laughs> or feeling, okay? But imagine in this context that if we had a few people within the church who had decided that they were going to take this vow, and then the day came. And maybe we even collectively together sacrificed a little bit 
so that they could get to this level of special blessing, right? And then the priest took the hair and put it in a place where it could be lit on fire. That hair that represented those years of sacrifice. And there would have been different terms for each vow. And we have extra uh, biblical uh, conversation about people who took these vows. And, you know, people would take them for three months, and they'd get all the way there, right? And then there was, like, a queen that took seven years to complete her Nazarite vow. And there was people that never made it. They got to the, you know, last rungs of the final test, but just couldn't quite do it, and they had to go back again, right? And so when somebody accomplished this great sacrifice, and that smell of burnt hair was in the air, it would have been like a community of celebration because of the sacrifice that a young person was willing to make, or any person was willing to make, because they wanted to, and this is what they wanted, okay? This verse will be familiar to you, but I think contextually it gives it meaning, because we have a, a, a break here in our Bible, but this w- w- there would be no break in the original writing of this, right? It says, the priestly blessing. The Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, This is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face to you and give you peace. So the goal would have been to posture oneself with the greatest ability to receive the blessing of God that comes from God's face shining on you. You think of a mom or a dad with a little newborn baby, and you, like Katie and I have videos and we watch it, and we listen to the voices we were making, and we see the faces that we were making, and we're finally like, who is that human being? Like, that is an intoxicated person that's doing these. But the concept is that a parent's face, looking down at their, at their little baby, activates the oxytocin in the brain for that baby, and parent. And that bonding mechanism begins as you make all those funny, crazy faces. And, you know, I was at Disneyland on Thursday, and I'm walking through the line, and there's just a little baby across from me, and everything in me could not stop me from just giving him a face and just looking him in the eye and just trying to make that connection of, like, of love and like, wow, what a celebration. You have this incredible little baby. Oh my gosh. And every time the presence of God is communicated in the Old Testament, the idea that God's presence is with you, it's through this this Hebrew words of God's face shining on you. God's neck turned towards you, right? And uh, I think we have this slide here, but uh, this is kind of fun that, oh, no. Ah, It's so weird. Our PowerPoint is doing strange things because that is not in my PowerPoint, okay? (laughs) (laughs) But I'll just do it. That's from last week if you were here. That's hilarious. Okay, so we're going to skip the PowerPoint idea, but I'm going to just show you, okay, this is a little anecdote, anecdote from Wikipedia, okay? So, you know Spock from Star Trek, right? What is Spock's symbol that he does? Can you do it? Right. The live long and prosper symbol, right? We all know that. But did you know that the priestly breath blessing of Aaron that was spoken every day 
over the nation of Israel to remind them of their identity, to remind them that God is in a good mood, to remind them that the blessing of God is already there. You know, a lot of times we pray, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. But it's like, no, God has already prepared the blessing. He's trying to prepare us for the blessing. So when you, when you do a priest, Leonard Nimoy, who did the Spock symbol, okay, or the Vulcan symbol, he, he was a good Jew. And so he was reminded of when he was in temple, and he saw this funny little thing that the priest would do with his hands when he pronounced the blessing, right? And so he just borrowed this from this scripture that we have. It became an iconic symbol, right? But the priestly blessing, the hands of the priest would go in this little way to remind them of all that the blessing entailed, okay? And they would do that. We'll practice at the end. We'll try it out, okay? But how I think this lands for us is that if you're like me at times, it seems really nice to skip steps. But God makes it pretty clear that on certain things, and especially the hard stuff, sometimes it takes a vow. And we have this concept too, right? Two examples might be one of the ways people would take a Nazarite vow is if they have something that they're struggling with and they've tried everything else. Right? Like they have an addiction and they've tried everything else but the Nazarite vow, this special consecration, right? We, we know this. If you want out of a pit of addiction, if you find steps of discipline, you will have freedom on the other side of that. We have 12-step programs that have proven that time and time again, right? If you want to have a lasting marriage, one thing that I will never compromise on is two people. You know, everybody wants a shorter wedding these days. But the reality is, you better make a vow. You stand with that person, and you make this commitment and you don't know what's going to happen in the future. Where all of life's wandering and suffering and pain will lead the two of you. But because you made a vow and you committed yourself to one another, it doesn't matter. And how many people within this church do we know who have lived the life of sacrifice and dedication to their spouse who was struggling, whether it was some health issue, where they need to go next in their life, or whatever it may be. And day in, day out, right now, Donna Blythe is with her husband, caring for him. You know, and he may not have that much time left, but her dedication because of her vow of love, right? So, you know, Nazarites might seem a little weird until we really think about the narrow steps that God gives us towards abundant life his way, his truth, his life. And one of those is we find out in places like 1 Timothy, right? It says that if you love money, 
that is a root evil. It says money is the root of all evil. And I know many people that have succumbed to that root problem and disease. Jesus is most plain about the discipleship step of offering a tithe, offering a vow to God about the things in our life that are hardest and saying, if you need to do them, perhaps you need to commit yourself to it and not ask a question no matter where the winding road may lead you in the future. And this is why. Because you owe it to your future self. You owe it to the future you who on your deathbed there will be people, and we've seen this many times in this congregation, who are going to stand up and say, in that moment when I needed them the most, they were there with generosity and care. And we do this on a larger level within the church. We do this, we don't even know what's going to happen in the future. But we come together and we sacrifice our finances because we say, you know what? We're just committed to it. Committed to getting each other the love and care and support that we need in the future through this community. And so whatever it is for you, you know, the classic time, talent, treasure, wherever your commitment needs to take that next step in discipleship, I pray, I pray that I and you and we together could see what this church can become when we sacrifice together. Because there is no crown without a cross. And when the sacrifice is made and we smell the burning hair, we will know that we are going to see the smiling face of God. Okay? So will you stand?